To turn scrub and jungle from wasteland into crop and pastures is a constant challenge to the farmer, the grazier and the nation. The age-old tangle of shrubs, vines and trees must be beaten. The problem is as old as farming itself. Overrun by vine and tree in tangled, useless profusion. this notion that we're entering an epoch or an era where it's humans who are the major influence over uh, physical and biological processes on the planet. When you think that we knocked out nearly two million hectares of forests in the early part of this century, when we knew better, um, that's pretty extraordinary, I think. I think as a world we're realising we're reaching the limitations here of our clearing and we need to start to rebuild because the forests and the natural systems give us our life. Water, air, um, all of that starts with a forest and I think we've forgotten that. You know, we can afford to do better, and we should do better. Uh, we certainly can't run around lecturing everybody else if we can't fix up our own backyard. And our own backyard looks, looks a bit grim. If we continue with just a mon monocultural approach, and that monoculture's re resulting from the clearance of forests and um, other native uh, flora, then, then we are sort of heading down a very negative pathway. We just can't keep tearing it down and clearing it with I think we've reached a limit to that and now we need to look at rebuilding and it's possible. So land restoration projects are a really creative way of looking at marrying um, the pr production of food in a much more sustained fashion with uh, enhancing biodiversity by using endemic species uh, to link uh, large parcels of natural land and also all of those are capturing carbon. Land restoration becomes a key because in states like Victoria where private land is the predominant ownership it's got to be the private landowners that contribute. And I, so I think that's w where we come in with the positive land restoration messages. I think there's some really good examples um, currently in Australia. Um, they tend to be community driven. Uh, and in our book, Linking Australia's Landscapes, that we did for CSIRO last year, uh, we've brought together some classic examples of both grassroots building up into large scale corridors, but also um, plans where you just the local people get together in a conservation management network and pool their resources. So there's some very strong possibilities in this area. Often it's the people who have a vested interest in that landscape who get involved in community-driven landscape restoration. It's the farmers, it's the friends of groups, it's the land care groups. People really need to be connected to their landscape. The first grant that the Foundation ever gave out was to the Regent Honey Eater Project back in 1997. So they've got a long history, this organisation, of working with private landholders to put in um, habitat corridors. And they're beginning now to see 
some results with certain bird species moving across the habitat. Uh, private landholders realised uh, that um, from the number of dead trees in the district and mistletoe proliferation killing old trees all over the place and people were seriously concerned about the landscape collapsing under their very noses. This is year 19 now, uh, we're up to um, nearly 1500 hectares of habitat that we've either protected or restored or both um, and it's well over half a million seedlings that we've put in the ground up to date. No, region honey eaters are, are rich patch specialists. So adding on to the little bits that are left to make them bigger, extending it into the more productive country so we get more nectar production and safer, denser habitat like you see up the hill here. That's where the regent can get its feet in and get a chance at the nectar. So the Norman Wettenhall Foundation's landscape restoration program actually started with connecting country in the Mount Alexander region the most important part of the project at the beginning was to look at the base structure of how the group was going to work and they've had tremendous success over the last seven years and so that has been a really a really great story about the community getting together putting together a project and you know driving it themselves. I think uh, there are a lot of benefits from organisations like that being local and, and being on the ground knowing the area it's not just a decision being made in Canberra or Melbourne, the decisions are made locally. The Committee of Management is made up of local people. General community education has been for Connecting Country um, a useful tool and I think increasingly could be just to raise awareness um, from the, you know, by the general community but also by farmers of, um, of the integration of production and, and environment. Our family has been on this property since, since the early 1860s. Um, and uh, my father was a, a sheep and beef farmer and I'm now a, really a sheep farmer who's also got an interest in environmental markets and, and you know, really integrating conservation and, and agriculture. Um, I see these two very significant parts of you know, what we do and, and how we exist and, and really recognising that native species have a right to exist. We've recently purchased a, a property near Barfold, just on the back of the Barfold Gorge. Um, it's about 1170 acres. I have always thought that it'd be really good to get it protected with Trust for Nature, to get a covenant put on the sections of the gorge of this property. The long term for us is to, to protect about, probably about a third of the property, uh, take, out from, take away from agriculture um, most of the gorge country where there's some threatened species, where there's also the the, uh, the Pipers Creek and the Compassby River, and uh, but also to link up there's some significant patches of native vegetation on the other side of the property as well. So to to link what's on the east with the gorge that's on the west. So we'll um, potentially put into a covenant, you know, the the limitations of the agriculture use on those those areas. So although they may be still grazed and and used agriculturally, they won't be able to be intensively fertilised, they won't be able to be ploughed up, they won't be able to sown down to crops or you know, improve pastures, that sort of thing. So we're really trying to um, protect in perpetuity the conservation values that they still have. Hopefully in three or four years, any wins that we have, we can really share those with the rest of the community and um, really give back in the way that Connecting Country's you know, been very generous in, in giving out and helping us, you know, not only with, with with you know financial help but also with information and and support through this whole process of, of planning the property like this so that's our goal that we can yeah really give something back peer group mentoring is basically about one landholder leaning over the fence and talking to another landholder about what works what doesn't work and what can happen on one's property and we think that the crux of community driven landscape restoration is that this knowledge sharing is happening at the local level uh, it was sort of one of our meetings that um, probably about eight or nine years ago that um, why don't we set up a mentoring system and, and uh, use the farmers and the people within our network as mentors. So we, we've put our mentors through some professional training and, um, and information sessions and so the, the mentor now takes the site report back to the 
farmer, providing they would like to have a mentor, most of them seem to want to have one, and then they can, they can continue the discussion. So the mentor is the, is the, is the face of the network for the, for the landholder. If the mentor can't answer the question, well, he's got a, a broader network of 200 members and, and other partners that we can draw upon to come up and, and help with solutions and, and provide, provide answers. The whole peer group mentoring, Otwager Forest Network ethos and philosophy is about you know, working with trusted people and, and giving people confidence to do things, to know that they're supported and that there are people they can go to and work with. So this is an important site that's being developed by Ballarat Region Tree Growers uh, because it's a site, a revegetation site uh, with a difference. It actually incorporates for some forestry into the environmental planting. The Biorich planting system, design system, endeavours to revegetate areas with plants that will actually survive for more than two centuries. So to achieve that we've actually set out to mimic the natural system. Uh, we've incorporated a plant diversity, more structure into the design. Plantations need to be wider. They have to have connections with, uh, with remnant vegetation, ideally, and with water. And they have to be able to achieve longevity. So in that we're looking at uh, genetics uh, for seed collecting and also group planting, which is really important in the whole system. So if we look behind us here, we've got some really important aspects of the bioridge system. We've got a group of uh, acacias behind me, which are group planted, and that's a shrub layer. And behind them you can see some forestry trees that were part of the, the forestry, uh, in forestry that's been incorporated into this environmental planting. Incorporating these old trees into uh, a new plantation actually matures them by about 80 years or more because it actually takes about 80 years for hollows to start to develop in these old tr in, in young trees. And more than 300 different species of Australian fauna require these hollows as part of their life cycle. So it's really critical that these trees are kept and incorporated into these revegetation sites. At Lal Lal here we probably have about 10% uh, of the, the trees are actually for profit. That's not to say that some of the indigenous plantings can't be developed for profit. Just this morning I was here collecting seed of some of the tree everlasting and in five minutes I collected probably $80 worth of seed. So there's all sorts of positive outcomes from this sort of unexpected outcomes from this sort of, of mix. I think it's an important next step that we need to take to actually look at the biorich planting system on a variety of topographies and soil types as well as how the mix of economic and environmental plantings uh, can be developed. Uh, in Sri Lanka there's an emerging movement uh, around analogue forestry regenerative agriculture systems that tend to plant more of a mix of trees for products and for food to actually help the poorer farmers restore their natural environment whereas and at the same time provide income and food for their families. Analogue forestry emerged from Sri Lanka. That's where the thinking started and the proponents of that now have learnt how to rebuild a forest system and, and in a way that is also commercially useful. So they're tackling different, different problems at the same time, rebuilding forest looking at commercial outcomes so that people who live in, in and around those forests can actually have a livelihood, meanwhile strengthening the forest support that they get. The major component, uh, the agroforestry or analog forestry or candy at home garden is actually the cash crop. So they get a cash flow uh, sort of throughout the year. They utilize or uh, they capitalize the monsoon time and to get a lot of paddy fields and get the rice going. And after that, they, they come to the harvest, the jackfruit, which is a very major component. 
And the, the tree timber as well is important component as well. Plus they have the love cardamom, cinnamons and the other fruits as well, you know, cashew and all sort of things as well. So it is actually diverting the people not to touch the remaining uh, untouched forest as well. So sort of a win-win situation. Uh, forest is also maintained. There is no logging going on. At the same time, people are happy with the cash flow. But, uh, and uh, in the international organizations can come and learn and to apply that model to the other parts of the world as well. I was in Colombo and I picked up a, a magazine on organic f farming, knowing how ignorant I was about uh, how to farm in this place. And the last article was by a person called Kamal Mulvani, and it made incredible claims as to what had been done in a very short time on a number of projects. I said, can I believe that? I must talk to this person uh, and see. Well, that was the beginning of our very, I believe, very productive relationship. I'm learning about the nature of regeneration of land, the importance of the riparian strips in retaining water along the way as it comes down from the, from the highlands, the significance of leguminous plants in uh, establishing the beginnings of a richer cover for the land and of course the enormous variety of plants that are needed to achieve the aims of analog forestry. Today it is possible for us to, in participation with the collaboration of a farmer and his family, transform the most degraded piece of land, wherever in Sri Lanka it may be, and not just in Sri Lanka, it's the principles that matter. It is possible in three or four or five years to transform a very degraded piece of land into a productive, shady, aesthetically pleasing environment that increases farmer income, improves habitat for biodiversity and increases fertility in the soil. That is possible. I say that with absolute confidence. When you are coming here, there's, uh, actually there are only uh, like sand uh, in the, uh, on the land. There is nothing uh, leaf litter. Now we can see that uh, how much uh, leaf litter is here. Now the soil fertility is uh, very high. This leaf litter count is very high. There is a water absorbency is very high. That is what we want to uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, put into the practice with the farmers. Now the, after four years time, we saw that this uh, aquifer has been recharged. They are the down downstream. We saw that the water is coming, water is, uh, what do you call that, uh, spring, like uh, spring uh, water came, little by little. That is what uh, our expectation has to come into the, uh, the uh, what do you call that, success, success story. It was a challenge for us to take what we learned and now apply it with a farmer, with a farmer's family where he wasn't too concerned about which butterfly and which bird. His main concern was that if he restored or transformed his or con converted his garden into a tree dominant agricultural situation, how he could economically benefit from that exercise. This farmer Peter was totally intent 10 years ago to cut 
this section of riparian forest, really valuable riparian forest, mature with lianes and whatnot. And so we convinced him that he, if he developed this side as an analog forest with pepper and coconut and areca and cinnamon and mango and uh, various types of citrus and banana, uh, he would have no need to cut this side and plant only banana. And now 10 years mm -hmm. later, ice, yeah, and his, the way they did it was they totally cleared everything, totally clean raised the ground from there. And, uh, planted. Now see. If we want to actually increase uh, the number of pollinators who visit the garden, increase the role between predator and prey, increase the biological activity in this garden, we would certainly need to put in our landscape design a substantial num number of endemic species species that for millennia had evolved, flora and fauna that had evolved together. We did uh, inventories of the forest here, different forest sites, because there are three elevations. This goes from 500 uh, MSL to 3500 MSL, this mountain range. So we did uh, biodiversity inventories at um, ground level, in the middle, on top, in savannas, in the different uh, ecosystems here, especially the riparian ecosystem. So our planting was targeted, our propagating uh, in our nurseries. So everything, the landscape design took into consideration the biodiversity, the water, the soil, what was here before. All of this contributed to making this grand landscape design for this mountain. No matter what we do, in the final process, it is the farmer, or rather the farmer will maintain what he thinks, what his family thinks is valuable. That decision of what he will maintain and what he will continue with is beyond us, lies with the farmer. So finally, it is what he thinks is worthwhile that matters. You know, I, I think generally farmers are good um, stewards of the land, but they're often in um, quite a dilemma about how they can increase their production and their yield and their profit at the same time, you know, improve their natural resource base. I, I think it's very, very easy to sort of um, impose our particular personal goals or what we think the community's goals are for the land onto farmers and have unreasonable expectations about what farmers might do to protect the environment on a large scale. I think it's very difficult to enrol landholders into the vision if it's, if it's imposed from somewhere else, if it's transported from somewhere else and it doesn't actually mean something to them at the scale that they're working at. And I don't think enough time and energy has been spent on understanding what motivates and will influence farmers at that more local level to protect um, environmental assets that the whole Australian community values. Well, the reason why we set up Jigsaw Farms or called it Jigsaw Farms was because we wanted to talk about connections between uh, the properties and to actually physically connect them, um, particularly with when we were planning the farms. We, we talked about and we planned uh, to have corridors linking um, which involved revegetation, wetlands and agroforestry sort of lined by our laneway system so that we could access all the farms. It is it's a cracking tree. I think it's one of the best stories we've got at Jigsaw is it is about integration of both farm forestry, permanent revegetation and high input pastures. We double the amount of food and fibre that is produced off the same amount of country of when we purchased the property 
uh, till now, yet at the same time we've taken out 20% of the country for uh, agroforestry, which is a later source of income, sort of 25 years further along, but with co-benefits along the way, and also uh, the permanent revegetation, re which also has the benefit of obviously the biodiversity, but also some of the carbon offset opportunities. We came here in um, June 1980 uh, and bought this place. It was at the time locally regarded as a bit of a basket case, primarily because of bad dryland salinity, which affected the vegetation and caught, led to erosion and a whole string of other problems. I saw this as a challenge and set about uh, rectifying it from more or less from day one. We had a plan how to address it. For Telahiti here, we now have over 30% of the place under trees that are in no-go areas for domestic stock. In addition to that we've got an extra estimated something order of 250,000 trees on the place since we came here in 1980 through managed natural regeneration. Now we have uh, used the ridges to uh, get most of the uh, re-establishment trees on and that has led to lowering the water table by turning off the recharge tap because it was on the ridges that the water entered the landscape and once the recharge tap was turned off then the water table started to decline and the flats are now able to realise their production potential. That plus the fact that we have uh, specialised in uh, what we do uh, rather than just being bread and butter wool producers which we were when we started out we're now uh, high quality ultra-fine wool producers. That combined with the increased stocking rate has meant the difference between uh, being here and not being here. There isn't enough money in the world to be able to fix the environmental problems that we, we are facing, or, and that's whether it's Asia, Australia, or in any other country. What we've found is that working with the people on the ground who are best placed in the best position to help to rebuild environmental damage are also the people that depend on that land for their, for their livelihoods. And so it's important to work with them on several fronts for their livelihood, for environmental um, repair, uh, to improve that and also to help to strengthen community. Well, I think a diversity of thinking is really important. That's why a network is important. That's why community capacity is important and sharing of ideas to, to open our minds so we have that more creative approach. Smart design to me would be about revegetating 10% of our farming landscapes with multi-purpose vegetation to develop a really good biological infrastructure to support the agriculture and to address the environmental issues. And not only that, but connecting these farms so that we can have movement of flora and fauna up and down and, and sideways through our landscape so that we can have better adaptation in the face of climate change and that we then get good social values coming from this because if we're living in a, a more biodiverse, revegetated community, people feel happy about it. There's ecological, there's an ecological health component here as well. So we need to think about that also, not only for the protection of the stock and the soil, but for the protection of the uh, health status of the people who are living and working in the landscape. I think we've worked out the vision and that is around, you know, we need to restore the Australian landscape. So let's figure out, let's get to the, the guts of the problem and that is about where and how and what's it gonna cost and making hard choices. It's a question of putting life into something, giving agriculture a, 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 an honorable image, a proud image, something to be proud of something that you can go to sleep thinking that you've done something good. It's 
especially in our kind of cultures where karma is an important component, good karma, meritorious action. If you can generate life and positive spirit and a will, a will, a determination to do something good, something that you can die in peace with, that is the thinking, to bring it back. My teacher Upali Senanayaka said that if we can use the wisdom of our past and project it into the future, and that's important, that's significant, that's what I'm seeking. Of course, we cannot reproduce it, but we can regenerate what was good in it. That's the message here. Yeah.